Welcome back to the Rugby League Digest. I'm Michael Adams, and I'm here with Patrick Skeen, author of The Big O, The Life and Times of Olsen Filipina, Pacific Revolution Pioneer. Uh, thanks for joining me, Patrick. Greetings, Michael, and a uh, thrill to be on here. I'm a big fan of the podcast. Oh, good. Uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, it's such a remarkable, important story to tell. Uh, we're going to delve into it at length, but just to set it up, I want to get a bit of your history in terms of rugby league. What What is your rugby league story? My rugby league story as a fan is I grew up around uh, the Balmain Tigers. My grandmother lived in Lilyfield, so I was down at Leichhardt Oval for the great miracle that is the hill down there. That was a big part of my upbringing. It's where I first heard racism. So for me, it was the introduction to a lot of a lot of things, including the tribal nature of rugby league. And then I became a Canterbury Bankstown fan. Uh, I met Steve Mortimer in a pub in Wagga Wagga, and he spent half an hour talking to me. And that for me is one of the great miracles of rugby league is how close the players are to the fans. That's what I really love about it. They used to work with us as well, which was a real amazing time in the seventies and eighties. And um, I must admit, I've been harboring some feelings for the Auckland Warriors or the New Zealand Warriors (laughs) now with, with just they're so lovable and they try so hard and always seem to find ways to, to, to not, not fulfill their potential, but their fans love them. And then what they're doing for the competition and you know, leaving their homes for the coronavirus to make sure the comp's still alive and gets its broadcast money is great. I started writing about rugby league in 2013 for the footy almanac. In my work, I work, I have a multicultural marketing agency and we do a lot of sport work. So we connect a lot of the sports with multicultural communities and I really then realized how much rugby league means to the Papua New Guinea and increasingly the Pacific communities, not just as a game um, to show your skills, but as a, as a, an engine of economic empowerment, there's whole villages being rebuilt in the islands through the remittances off the back of rugby league contracts in the NRL. And I started to see uh, this new uh, revolution happening, the Pacific revolution and any, anyone that played at gl- grassroots and knows about it with the over representation and representative sides of Pacific and Maori players. And I was engaged by the guardian to write stories on what I call the invisible Australians, uh, migrants, Aboriginal, LGBTI, some remote and regional heroes that haven't had the same access and, and limelight that some of the mainstream stories have had. So I wrote a lot of stories. I wrote a story on Ian Roberts that went really well, but the story that went more than any other story was the Elson Filipina story. It was one of the most clicked on uh, stories of the year for Guardian Australia. And interestingly, it it was routinely popping back into the top 10 stories of the Guardian when someone in New Zealand would share it of some sort of influence and it would blast back into the, into the, into the top 10 articles of the Guardian. I thought this is interesting. So I was introduced to UQP. University of Queensland Press, who decided to, uh, they wanted to publish the book. And when I got a first draft to them, they said, oh, um, and and by the way, I'm 50-50 partners with Olsen in the book financially, because I don't think it's right that the storyteller gets 100%. I don't think it's right that the subject gets 100% if someone gives one and a half or two years of their life to to building the story. So I thought a 50-50 split was was fair, and it's an honor, honor to work with Olsen on that. Because Olsen is sometimes held up as the poster child of, of the, the Pacific player that lost all his money. And as, as you see in the book, it's not Olsen's fault at all. He was just being a good, a member of a Polynesian household by sending his money back to his parents who would then redistribute the money amongst the, amongst the family for the betterment of the, um, of the, of the extended family. And uh, UQP said, we really love the, um, the Pacific revolution angle, the cultural shift. That's amazing. This tiny group of people who've upended the game culturally would be willing to continue on as long as it's uh, more weighted towards a Pacific revolution and Olsen becomes one of 10 pioneers across the whole journey. And I couldn't really go back to Olsen and say, hey, I started with a a book about you and it's now about the Pacific revolution. Uh, I was here to tell Olsen's story. So we uh, cut ties in a very amical and classy fashion. And we had a few uh, rejections. Rugby league books are very hard to get up now, even though it has extraordinary support. It doesn't necessarily translate into book buying like the AFL market does or the rugby union market does in New Zealand, where Dan Carter can do 90,000 copies. Mm. Um, and, and, and there's a huge book reading market there. 
But we pitched to a group called Upstart Press in New Zealand. And when you're pitching to a, a company, you're, you're pitching to the people in many ways, the people you'd be working with. And there was a, a gentleman there by the name of Warren Adler, who's done over 300 sports biographies. And he, he did the recent Kieran Reid one. And he did Richie McCaw. And he said, I loved Olsen as a kid. There was a time when Olsen played when rugby league crossed over in New Zealand. And um, they, it was loved by all. So Upstart Press took it on. So it's gone from being an Australian book with a New Zealand side market to a New Zealand book with an Australian side market. And I think um, we'll sell out of Australian copies relatively rel re re relatively fast, even though post-COVID people, $40 now is a lot more than it was uh, before then, but courtesy of JobKeeper and a few other things, I think for some people it's stabilized and people can look at a story to escape. And it's gotten great press because there was a shortage of rugby league content during coronavirus. So um, we've had to cancel the launch event in Auckland and Sydney twice. Um, but a lot more people have read it now and uh, it's been very warmly received. And I think that can only uh, augur well for hopefully Father's Day. We'll do some events around Father's Day and have a, a second bite of the cherry. But that's the, the story. And I believe in rugby league, you don't, you shouldn't really pipe up unless you've got something really to say, like you're... Super League series. <clears throat> you can now speak with authority on Super League and people will listen because you've done the research. And in Rugby League, you've either got to do comedy, you have to be a specialist and know a lot about one thing or watch every game and be a statistic mm. uh, wizard or have played the game and that gives you a get-out-of-jail yeah, card. You yeah. can pretty much say whatever you want because <laughs> you, you're, you're, an, you're an ex-player. So I really didn't want to put my head up in Rugby League until I had um, a story to, to share and something to teach people and, and that comes through three years of research and pain and, and reading everything on the subject matter and then um, coming up with, um, for me, a mystery was Olsen Filipina and him being called an enigma and I've tried to go out of my way to solve it or at least explain it. Yeah, well, you've, you've touched on a few things there that I wanted to get to. Uh, one of the really interesting things from my mind is just the process. Olsen Filipina seems an unlikely source or an, an unlikely subject of a rugby league biography when you, you mentioned how hard it is to get them published, how many great players over the years don't have books written about them. Uh, so this Guardian article, was this the starting point of it all or were you already? That, that, that started it all. I, I, I Whichever article I wrote, about 20 articles for the Guardian on these types of stories and whichever one was most warmly received, I was gonna write a book on, that was my, so the story found me in that way but it is very difficult to get books published but I think you need a mission and I remember Olsen playing a lot better than the the narrative is around him he's actually you know in some cases um marketed as a busted player in the in the Winfield Cup but everybody I spoke to and in particular the players Wally Lewis Terry Lamb um Brad Izzard all said that he was easily in their top five five eights and they breathed a sigh of relief when a Sydney coach put Olsen in reserve grade because you remember those days you got the big league and the players would get the big league magazine. It would have the lineups and you'd see who you're playing against. And um, was part of the psychological warfare and players were just thrilled when Olsen was down in, in reserves. And that to me is the ultimate metric. Yeah. And is, is this something you remember from being a kid going to Balmain games? Do you have strong memories of watching him? I've got very strong memories. And he not only stood out um, as a clearly, what we know now as Polynesian player, but we didn't know back then. A lot of people sort of cursed him as an Aboriginal and he copped some of the same sledges that Larry Korowa um, copped racist um, abuse from the crowd. But I remember him just being unbelievable and barging over people. And I just remember the reaction of the people around me. Whenever he got the ball, there was excitement. Is he going to run it hard? Is he going to um, get his hands clear and set somebody up? He was just an excitement machine. Plus I remember some big hits and you could hear the hits back in the day and the crowd was really appreciative back in the um, those days. And he's famous for a couple of tackles, particularly one on Mitch Brennan, which pe people still talk about today. Mitch, poor Mitch Brennan got cut in two by Olsen and it's in some of the footage that's going around at the moment. And um, I remember, and it just didn't, the reputation he has, when I would say his name to people, they'd say, yeah, great for the Kiwis and a dud for Balmain. And it didn't fit with me. So I thought I'll go through every match report, every big league, every rugby league week, every um, microfished and um, digitized a copy of the Herald. And I saw journalists going at him for various things. The light bulb moment for me was when I found out that a lot of the times Olsen was dropped to reserve grade, often for considerable lengths of time, uh, was for disciplinary reasons, not form reasons. He 
uh, ran into some discipline, a disciplinarian and coach Frank Stanton who had his way and Olsen had his way. And if he was late to training or didn't want to go on a road run because of his knees or he'd done the, the garbage run in the morning, he would complain to Frank and Frank would bench him. That was just the way it was done. So I thought, okay, that's that's really interesting that you pick up big league and you see Olsen in reserve grade because we didn't have access to all of the games like we do now. You're just assuming he's out of form. But he often was playing very well the week before but had to be made an example of and that was the way it was done. So that was very interesting to me that it didn't tell the number of games he played did not tell and the stats did not tell the full story of his time when he was actually on the field. I spoke to some reserve graders and they said he was terrorizing them down mm. there as well while he's doing his penance for an infraction with, with Frank Stanton, but the poor reserve graders just, just copped it. So it was just interesting uncovering these things. The more you research on something, the more you open yourself up to these connections happening and a, a trail of evidence or just like a detective, a clue mm. that leads you on. Well, one of the th we'll get into this in more detail um, over the course of the interview, but it, just when you, you say the way he's perceived, a, a lot of a lot of what you hear is hot and cold. So your book goes into at great length some of those cultural issues he was facing, issues with depression, uh, and the rest of it. And you know, I, I think there's a quote by Wayne Pierce talking about how one week he was just brilliant, and and the next week he'd kind of go missing. And it's funny that perception where when when you have that stigma, hot and cold. It's almost like the hot doesn't count yeah. and, and all people go is, oh, you know, he was inconsistent. He, you know, couldn't really do it for long periods. It, it, it's funny that the cold so outweighs the hot in people's perceptions. There's an old quote that says, for those accustomed to privilege, equality feels like oppression. Now, when Olsen was just having a normal game, people would say he had a dud game. And I've watched countless games online and then I read the reviews and I went back and I thought, as a playmaker, he's just expected to shine all the time. And then the media jumps on it. I saw it with Aaron Woods. I've seen it with Mitchell Pierce. When they jump on it and a label gets slung at a player and it sticks, it's kind of lazy journalism because you don't have to think about yeah. that person again. They've, they've, got, they've got their tag. They've yep. got their label. And Olsen, like Usman Khawaja, had a sort of loping way of doing things. He didn't sprint around. He wasn't a fast twitch guy. He saved all of his energy for playing and he hated wasting energy at training. So he was just had that um, Kuwaja lope about him. A lot of people mistake it for laziness, but some people, you know, when he was switched on, he was on. But once someone gets a lazy or an enigma or carries a few kilos and is having to work them off, the media is all over them. And, and Brad, Idd Brad Izzard, who was an Anglo-Celt player who had the same type of build as Olsen, very bottom heavy, he got called fat a lot as well, even when he was actually fit. And that was a thing. Journalists had never seen this Polynesian body type, this sort of Matt Utai low to the ground that you can actually carry a lot of weight and be match fit as well. And Tony Kemp tells a funny story. And Tony Kemp was the next big playmaker to follow Olsen into the, into the Winfield Cup. And he says when he got to Newcastle, they all called him a little fat kid. And then when he beat them in sprints, they just couldn't believe it, that this guy could, could consistently be so fast and carry that, uh, you know, an extra, what well, they perceived to be an extra 10 kilos. And that's been one of the great wake up calls is the, the understanding of the, of the Polynesian build being very different to the, to the, to the Anglo build. And, and even in like non-Polynesian, it persists to this day, the idea that some players play better fat yeah. for, for whatever reason. It's, um, I don't know the science behind it, but there's something to it. Graham Lowe talks about that, that there were a lot of big men in Auckland who were match fit and they had a, a fitness built for rugby league. So in the second half, they'd still be going strong, but they wouldn't be marathon fit. And it's one you really got to struggle with because you assume if you can run 20 Ks, but rugby league is a short, sharp um, game of, of 10, 20 meter bursts. And some guys can do that. And if they can keep that weight, look at Arthur Beetson. I mean, he really had a great engine and could carry a lot of weight. Glenn Lazarus was amazing. A guy you'd say is a big, you couldn't imagine the cardio feats that Glenn Lazarus um, could perform. It's not like American football where there's seven minutes of action and you can really carry a lot of weight and just do short, sharp, explosive uh, bursts. In the old days, it was two reserves and you were on the whole game unless you got knocked out. So they had to be a lot fitter. And Olsen's carrying a, a hundred kilos at times. And because he could move so fast uh, over short distances, you apply Newton's law. It's force equals mass by acceleration and Olsen had that acceleration and he had the density he was a true formidable force to to tackle and he was voted by his peers in 82 1982 as the hardest player to tackle because you go high you get swatted you go low you get bumped mm. and there's a lot of stories of guys thinking they've got the solution to Olsen being laid flat out on their back and there's one good one involving Ray Price in the book
But with the like with with the ball skills and and the awareness of a five eight, the center as well had speed, uh, had creativity. Um, what do you think his ceiling was? His ceiling was the lack of cultural competence of coaches. They didn't really look at teams in an asset management way the way modern groups do. And Craig, you've got the same salary cap now. Uh, the money ball move is to get the best out of your Polynesian players, to get them firing, to get the $100,000 player feel playing like a $400,000. That's Craig Bellamy's magic. And Craig Bellamy, you would say, is a direct descendant of the Graham Lowe culturally competent model, really uh, Desi Hasler's of that school as well. If a player goes to jail, you're down at the police station. You support them through thick and thin, and they repay that with gratitude and the kind of team bonding that gets one plus one equals three, and you get those uh, those dynasties. And you think, why have we all got the same salary cap? Why can some coaches just coax more out of their players and as a unit? In many cases, with Aboriginal players at 12% and Pacific players at 48%, with 60% of, of the NRL's um, playing rank, elite playing ranks being of this group, if you're not getting the best out of them and understand that they each require a different and separate strategy, one size fits all is a dud model. And Alex Ferguson is on that plan. Um, Joe Lombardi was on that on that plan. Um, it was, um, it's just, it's cold now. And if you can't get the best out, if you don't know how to manage Polynesian and, and Aboriginal players now, you can't coach. You can't just can't get a role because the players will complain. They'll talk to each other. The managers will get whisper that don't go over there. That that guy doesn't get it. And the best players will naturally gravitate to places like the Storm where they will recruit both brothers because they know if both brothers are there, they will get the very best out of each other and be a great investment for the club. Graham Lowe um, and before him, Jack Gibson, were the pioneers of that. So the ceiling comes from um, threatening them with them going down to reserve grade, that works with Anglo guys, with Polynesians that just deflates their their spirit. They need to be supported. Not all, but some need to be treated like a second son if you want the very best out of them. And that, and that was um, alien to a lot of Australian coaches who really didn't care about the guy till he got there in the car park. It wasn't his business. And the last thing he would do is get close to that player and come in and solve their off-field issues. I mean, a great example is uh, Graham Lowe talking to Olsen's mother for an hour before selecting him to play against mm -hmm. Wally Lewis. I mean, that you can't imagine an Australian coach doing that, talking about love in the change room, mm -hmm. talking about tears of joy. We're going to cry when we win and all these hard leagues going, you're joking. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, they win and they're crying tears of joy. I mean, this is a revolution in the emotionally constipated world of, of rugby league. And it was a Kiwi that that, that brought it in, That, that who's, as, as Graham Lowe says in the book, that New Zealand's uh, DNA and is all over, uh, all over the modern rugby league style. Hmm. So Frank Stanton emerges as somewhat of a villain in the book, but it's clear he's just a product of his time and, and the wider rugby league culture. There were very few people like Graham Lowe, like Jack Gibson. Have, and, and then you mentioned Craig Bellamy, you know, in the modern age. Did you look much at, at that evolution and how we got to a position where cultural competency and, you know, coaching individuals, not, you know, thinking of everyone as just one collective. Have you looked at how that evolved and how we got to where we are now? I think it became a key element of the job description to either have a Polynesian coach or a Polynesian welfare officer as a communication conduit between the players and staff. Parramatta has a chaplain. Um, who solves a lot of the problems for the Polynesian uh, lads. There's share houses. The Bulldogs have a famous share house where a mama takes Sonny Bill and all the young young guys in and provides a culturally competent environment. Uh, chaplains are involved. Parents are now brought in to help solve problems, and that's the best way to get it out of the player. They'll set tasks for the players with the parents, so everyone has buy-in. It's just not a prescriptive a solution that, that, that doesn't work. Commentators are, have come a long way in pronouncing Polynesian names. I'm actually really proud of the commentators, the way they're rolling their eyes and getting into it. I mean, you have to look back. It's one thing came out of the book for me was how offended the Polynesians get by, um, by name pronunciations. For us, you know, Petro 70 cents a liter is, is hilarious. And that's just another example of culture, of cultural clash. Billy Birmingham had eight number ones in a row uh, mocking people's surnames. It's part of our culture to, to do wordplay with surnames. 
but for Polynesians, it's it's not funny. It's insulting, and if there's no intent to improve, it means that um, you know you're not pronouncing their name right, and it's it's the surname means everything. And people look at intent. If you're trying and they see you having a go, people are okay with that. But there was a lot of times early when the commentators wouldn't uh, wouldn't adjust to it, and that was really something I uncovered that I had no idea about it. And and it's just an interesting to me another example of cultural clash. But cultural clash is is is, is the biggest thing, and coaches have to understand now that if you had someone like Olsen were trying to teach him lessons, and he's a confidence player, such as Tendulkar is a confidence player in cricket, Brian Lara are the confidence players, Usman Kawaja confidence players and when you have the very best most talented player you don't crush their confidence they know that now they don't respond to that and if you if you lose a polynesian it's very difficult to get them back if they're humiliated in front of their teammates because in their culture they never answer their elders back so it's kind of a one-way a one-way fight as such and in some ways that makes them easier to drop because you know they're not going to complain they're just there's just a respect to elders um, value that's embedded in in the culture and it's an ancient embedding and it's not changing so when Nigel Vanganar and guys like Frank Pulitura have stood up to coaches that's going against thousands of years of culture mm -hmm. but they're also saying hey we have to evolve as well we just can't be punching bags we've got to stand up when Vanganar didn't talk to Jason Taylor when he didn't produce his uh, pronounce his name right that's a huge moment in in the Pacific Revolution I've, I've mentioned that in the book as well I don't know if you looked in it um, it's fresh in my mind because we just had our uh, episode on the 1995 World Cup, but that New Zealand team, you know, threatening to to boycott the semi final, and as a group, like getting up and you know saying to New Zealand management, we're, we're not going to take this, we're not going to play if you don't, um, you know, if you don't pay us what you said you would. I don't know if you um, looked into that incident and, and you know saw where that came from. Maybe I think it's all coming. It all stems from the 85 series. Uh, New Zealand were absolute whipping boys for Australia for 14 years in a row. And Olsen, Mark Graham, Kevin Tarmody, you know, giving the pack, he was fearsome. So they didn't look at the Kiwis as, you know, having less mongrel than them when they had Kevin Tarmody. Mark Graham was, you know, anyone that ever saw him play, there was, he was a one-off and he was a, a, a serious leader. Olsen, the playmaker, taking out the talisman, King Wally Lewis in the middle, Kurt Sorensen terrorizing the Australian backs. Uh, Lulu Wai, you know, with his sidestepping big Mal, Gary Prome, just an absolute reliable um, centre. Uh, Howie Tamadi in the middle, you know, really um, you know, didn't have an NRL career, but, you know, was unbelievable at, at test match level. They set the platform for the Warriors getting sufficient respect uh, in for 10 years later because we just thought New Zealand were a bunch of provincial bumpkins that it would occasionally produce a Winfield Cup tough forward, but nothing really. And what Olsen did to Wally in front of both nations set a template that, hey, we've got to take these guys serious. Serious. That leads to the Warriors in 1995. That leads to 2005, the Kiwis being serious heavyweights and knowing about their rights. And rugby league is the sport of rebellion. Um, you look at Lebanon right now and there'll be disputes with, with various groups. The UAE has a huge um, war going on with, with rugby union. It's always been this bastard mongrel child of rugby union that's always been starved of oxygen so it's always uh, in some state of revolution and the pacific guys have you know just really asserting their rights as as, as they see them and, and rugby league is once you've lost someone once they go over the top they they, they do it big time <laughs> let's go back to that 85 series and, and that era of kiwi football so that was you know the famous olsen getting picked out of reserve grade and one of the the reasons our show exists is i feel with rugby league history it's the same four or five stories repeated endlessly when we've got such a rich, rich history, so many stories. That that Olsen story is is kind of one of those stories. That was all I knew about him growing up. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I find even when you do, it's not Sattler's jaw level, but it is, is one of those stories you hear about. I find over the course of doing our little research thing, even stories you thought you knew, once you look into it, once you dig into it, you find there's so much more. Um, is there anything about that incident and that period that, that you learnt about in the course of this book? When I saw Kevin Tarmody beat up Greg Dowling, I really didn't know that it, that it had been on the end of years of niggly racial abuse. And when Gary Campbell told me we never got anything after that, that seems like a real turning point for Australian behaviour on field, where they're actually looking at New Zealand as brothers now and growing the game and not as this group just to be vilified and put down and crushed. 
and a 14 year losing streak at home at your own you know, to, to, to turn up to Carlaw Park and, 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 and get beaten consistently. They needed to simultaneously outskill Australia and outmuscle Australia. And that's why Olsen and Kevin Tarmody stand as two towering figures and, and Mark Graham as well stand as two towering figures. I hadn't really thought about Olsen's depression actually now being diagnosed retrospectively as a clear case of depression. He withdrew from society, didn't like to leave his room. He got racially abused by workmates, by teammates, by opposition and fans. It was just, a, it was all around. And we didn't know the power of racism. We just knew that was something to get at someone with if someone was fat. And colour was just one of those variables of trying to get under someone's skin. I don't think, some some knew but I don't think we, ne we we now we look back to see the effects of that has on people that it's just a, a dehumanization. And I include one study in the book of African American parking officers who were researched on all, all the various abuse they got as parking officers. And that probably draws the number one, the number one abuse mag magnet position. And they said whatever they were called, but when they were racially abused, there was no amount of skits or counselling that could work with them. They were kind of broken. But, by that. So that was a, 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 I knew about racism, but I really didn't know how deep it was and that it was something that Kevin Tarmody single handedly wanted to, uh, to put to an end in the most brutal fashion. And sometimes bullies only understand force. Mm. And that was a, a apparent to me that day. The other thing that came out of it was I really didn't know that New Zealand was so racially fractured under Robert Muldoon, who was the equivalent of John Howard. He really only governed for his image of New Zealand, which is, you know, the dour, conscientious white farmer who plays rugby union. And he did pretty bad things to the Samoans and, and Māori. There was a dawn raids. They locked up a lot of overstayers, even though there were English and Australian, more English and Australian visa overstayers than Pacific ones. They specifically targeted them and deported some of them back to Samoa. And that doesn't make you feel part of a country. And if you look at now players uh, going to play, New Zealand players going to play for Tonga and Samoa, it's because they were rejected for so long that they really did develop, they didn't develop the Kiwi identity like they potentially could have because their parents were treated badly and treated like outsiders. And you see people still being very Tongan. And now we look at it and say, hey, you should be grateful to New Zealand. But they, they were made to feel like the other for, for, for a long time. So that um, 1985 team healed a lot of those wounds. It was the first time New Zealand had seen this new image of itself. David Longy, this new... Kevin Rudd style prime minister came in promising to govern for all of New Zealand and put an end to um, just focusing on, on Anglo Celtic New Zealanders. And it was a new and refreshing time, but they didn't have a face. The All Blacks were still mostly white. All the other sporting teams were mostly Anglo Celtic, but the 1985 Kiwis were a real reflection of the new New Zealand. They had Anglo Celtic players led by Mark Graham. They had Olsen at five, eight, they had Maori players, Kevin Tamati, and they all came together, all hugging each other, all coming together as a unit. And at court rugby union with their pants down, basically they, um, they were still reeling in the PR war from the 1981 Springbok tour, which tore New Zealand apart. They were riding and punching the hell out of each other, these two sides. And 1985 gave white New Zealand and Pacific New Zealand and Maori New Zealand a team to get behind. And you look at the, the viewing numbers on that 85 series, 50% of all males, 20 to 49 watched that game. Mm -hmm. And have that embedded, have Olsen slicing up King Wally embedded in their psyche from a tiny little playing base in New Zealand, a game beaten up by rugby union at every, at every turn. So I really hadn't linked, and it was a New Zealand historian called Gordon McLaughlin who passed away early this year. It makes me sad that he didn't get a copy and get to see some of his commentary because he threaded it all together and said that, that, that 1985 team was the new New Zealand on display. We can't turn back now. Not one, not one group has ownership over New Zealand. We all do. And this is our new image to, to show out to the world. That's, you've, you've partially answered one of my questions there because I, I found the, the social history aspect of it, in particular New Zealand in the 70s, uh, Auckland in particular, uh, just really riveting, um, absolutely captivating history. Uh, so did you know much of that going in? Did you know that that part of the story would be so rich and formative? I had no idea. I mean, we weren't taught that in schools and I work a lot with Pacific and Maori communities here, but a lot of them don't know about it as well. If you don't control the textbooks, you don't, um, and it's not fair. 
like I knew there was a sort of black power reggae thing that went on in Auckland. I knew South Auckland was not a place to be trifled with. Um, but how that came to occur and what drove, what, what forces drove these, these Tongan and Samoan kids into gangs, that they were rejected by the new culture and rejected by the old culture and just sort of fell in between. And that left a vacuum for American hip hop gang culture to walk in and capture the hearts of these, of these kids. Yet out of it comes David Tua. Frank Bunce, Jason Tamalolo, Olsen Filipina, Mark Hunt in UFC, Joseph Parker, world uh, boxing champion. Um, out of out of this uh, tough area come some of the greatest athletes in the Southern Hemisphere has ever produced. So there's good and bad, but I, I knew nothing about it. So I had to go and live in South Auckland, immerse myself, walk around, get the feel of it, go up to Kaiko Hair where Olsen was born to get the feeling of this Napui spirit that just runs through his his bones, his mother's his fighting spirit. You know, no one taught me that the Napui people in the north, they got muskets as well, and they slaughtered the Redcoats in four out of five battles in the Northern War and sent the English effectively scurrying back to Auckland and the future of the colony was at stake. I'd never heard the British, had, you know, once they were locked into a fair battle with Indigenous people with the same weaponry, um, got absolutely slaughtered up there. So that was all news to me, and it's given me a much more, a much different view of 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 the founding of New Zealand. I thought New Zealand was a takeover, but it wasn't. The Māori chose Britain over America and France as a, a trading partner, so they were invited in. So the, the two foundings of the cult of Australia and New Zealand are so markedly different, and just to see what difference a treaty makes mm. in making white New Zealanders more comfortable that they actually have a, a, a right to be there and they don't have to put the Māori down as a... Um, as a fundamental for their for their being there, it's just um, all blew my mind. I had a lot of people explain it to me, and slowly you you get that out that outsider's curiosity gets rewarded with patterns and, and understanding. How in in your experience doing the research there and you know Im immersing yourself, how how fresh is that history in in the Maori communities? Is that something that is uh, spoken about and and is it is it in the front of their minds? No. No, they have to watch the same documentaries we do. What there has been is a massive revitalization in Maori language learning. And part of that, the stories come as part of that and the perspective. So they don't talk about Captain Cook. They talk about Kupe, the original great Polynesian navigator that came down a thousand years ago with a great fleet, 4,000 kilometers from Tahiti down to, I mean, following the birds and using the currents and the winds and following the stars. Just incredible. They have, you know, extra. Now, that's not to say Captain Cook, I've done my research, uh, was a great man himself and quite a risk taker, but they couldn't do it without instruments. They couldn't go into the wind. They couldn't do a lot of things. And it was uh, Tupaya, who was Captain Cook's navigator, that's responsible for a lot of his. We don't hear about him. Mm. We don't hear about the Sherpa along Tenzing, alongside Edmund Hillary, who climbs Mount Everest. Whereas they worked together to navigate around the Pacific and Tupé, you could blindfold him and turn him around and he could still tell you where his island was. There was, without any skerrick of doubt, the Polynesian are by far the greatest navigators the world's ever uh, ever come across. In New Zealand, the Māori and Polynesians don't get taught that. Um, it's nothing. It's just a, a whitewashed version of history because one version of history, the colonizers version of history, doesn't really want to acknowledge the greatness of the group of people they've, they've colonized. And it was the... in introduction of Christianity and that really stopped a lot of movement between the islands and the Pacific Island went from this great highway to being a scary beast like the rest of us do it. But, you know, it's amazing. You look at Easter Island and Hawaii, this group of people colonized one third of the world's surface, just going out. There's an adventuresome spirit inside them. You see it in rugby league now, the joy they have playing the game. And that's one other key thing that I've learned is that they've brought love into rugby league. Um, guys, there's a lot less hatred, there's less sil silver tails and fibros, and a lot of, I see a lot of love with the players after the game. It's infected the, um, they all hug and bro shake, and you know, I often say if you'd, 40 years ago you told me that rugby league players would hold hands after game and sing songs to each other opposing players, you would just, <laughs> you, would, yeah. you wouldn't think it's feasible, but it's a very normal, normal thing now. You've seen the re-entry of Christianity into the game, which has positives and challenges at the same time is that going to discourage atheists and other religions if you know 
it has to be sectarian, but when such a significant part of your cohort is Christian, it's, uh, it just presents challenges. So all of these new things are happening, but it's rugby league again, rugby league, the only game to be founded on a principle says Tony Collins in the book. Mm -hmm. And it's rugby league continuing to service. Like there's a lot of the Anglo Celts have left the housing commissions and Pacific guys are in there. It's still servicing the same working class demographic. As Fred Arcoy said to me in New Zealand, all the white tradies are rich now. <laughs> In New Zealand, it doesn't have, um, you know, they, they resonate with the All Blacks now. They've got million dollar houses. Mm -hmm. But it's now the Islanders that are in the Meatworks. And, you know, Olsen says the Meatworks games of rugby league were the toughest games. Playing on a Wednesday, you get the afternoon off, but you have to go and slug it against guys. And there are a lot of head high tackles. And uh, it's a lot of Polynesians and Maldi in the Meatworks now. So rugby league is still servicing that working class demographic. It's the, it's the working class demographic that's changed. It's really interesting. It's something I just thought of as you were speaking, uh, you know, bringing the love into rugby league and, and that shared community that, that we're seeing. At the time we're recording this, we're coming just out of the, the Michael Jordan last dance hype. And, and one of the, the big talking points between the NBA now and in the 80s and 90s when Jordan was playing is that Jordan and the others of his ilk had this ultra competitive nature. There wasn't this fraternization. Now it's it's seen as this weakness among current players that they're hanging out together, they're engaging on Twitter, wherever else. I I, re, I haven't really experienced much of that blowback in rugby league. I, I think it's something that's that's just celebrated. Yeah, um, I think it's celebrated now. Like there was there was once a time when the fibros wouldn't talk to the silver tars, or or it would be I'll see you behind the sheds. Um, in the in the old ways, I think those first two rounds of this year's comp, the twenty twenty competition, where we heard the intensity of the hits for the first time. I mean, I love this cove just for one year, just to hear what the players are saying, to hear what the referee um, is saying, and you do hear that to a degree, but you hear it crisper now, and to hear the hits. And when I've heard mates interviewed from different teams, they seem to want to get each other more. Mm. Their mates, because it's not illegal, and to get a good shot on your mate's ribs is going to be hilarious conversation at the coffee shop the next week. And the players move so freely between clubs that a guy you hate, you could be playing next to him um, in, in the coming years. There's not really those one club, you might get a franchise player like Tamalolo, which a club smartly stitches up on a long-term deal. But it's pretty much expected with these money ball tactics that coaches are adopting now that you're going to be moved at some stage of your career. And you don't know where. Um, and you, there's also a lot of guys who played together in rep teams that are super chummy now from camps and, and that's carrying through. But I really think that it's Graham Lowe that introduced love as a concept that it could even be discussed. And in the book, Mark Murray, Australian uh, halfback in that 85 series, played under Graham Lowe at the Norths, and he acknowledges that. He said you could have had 9,000 coaches. No one was talking about loving each other back then to get a more cohesive Spartan style, um, Spartans took it another step um, to get cohesion between their between their troops. But it was all about loving the guy next to you means you're going to be tighter in battle and you'll fight harder. And a disparate group of guys that don't care for each other. And that's why players, when, when someone interrupts that and causes problems in the club, even if they're a good player, they're moved on these days because that bad apple can infect everybody and stop that cohesion that can bring guys wanting to come back from injury earlier, really competing for spots. Uh, not being sooky when they're dropped, the 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 the, the sum the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, and those they're championship teams or they become contenders. You once you get into the finals, it seems to be with the gods. Uh, not always the best team wins, injuries and things can strike, but to, to be, become a contender, that's all the coach can ask. And to do that, um, love and, and and feeling that the coach loves you because they've got a huge influence in your life, greater than your father now, for that period, and some players really respond to thinking that the coach cares for them and that makes them do all the things you need to get the best, makes them watch their diet. They might not go with that groupie or have that drink at the wrong time. All of these factor in on how much you love the coach and how much you think the coach loves you and you don't want to let that gray haired father figure down. So all of these um, things factor in to getting the best out of, out, out of players. And that love, I think, is, I mean, we still we still are a hard game. We don't like to show pain. We've seen guys commit suicide before wanting to talk about it. There's a lot of problems with it. But this um, stoic part of rugby league is really, and, and AFL to a degree, and union, 
of not showing pain has really stopped the growth of soccer in this country in many ways. Because we, when, when you're conditioned by that to see guys rolling around and milking a penalty and winning a game through acting is kind of against our core principles mm. of, 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 of contact sports. And, and it's, yeah, it's come down to, I just, it's a book about love. Some people see it as a book about love. Some, some people see it as a instruction manual to getting the best out of Polynesians. Other people say it's about empathy and vulnerability. You know, Graham Lowe would open players up like an oyster, find out their fears, get them to talk. Now this mutual disclosure thing is fundamental. Waratahs, whoever it is, the first training camp, they're talking about what they fear, their sad moments in their life, and it, it's used as a bonding agent to get players tight. And I think it all started with Graham Lowe. And to a degree, Graham Lowe says Jack Gibson was my was my mentor. Mm. mentor. So, so Big Jack really sits at the at the apex of it all. That's I, I love that line. It's a book about love because it, it's a, actually a really difficult book to classify because there, there's the biographical element, but then it's also a really valuable piece of social history as well. You, you mentioned the, I, I guess, tension bet between you and um, the University of Queensland Press about what the book should be. How did you strike that balance between telling Olsen's story but framing it uh, in this, this wider uh, story and giving it all this context? I think stripped of the context and the history, it can be quite a sad book. If you didn't know what his sacrifices led to and what he was the pioneer of, if I just told Olsen's story and if I, because I had the choice, I can do a biography where I ghost it or I work with him and it's Olsen's story. But if you haven't got that context explaining all of these things about depression, about vulnerability, about how coaches use empathy now as, as key tools, about cultural competence, if you don't have that, it's a sad story. Um, if you have the context and the life and times and the fact that he wasn't alone and he suffered this alongside other players and that you know, Richard Pratt once said a very interesting thing that we're all about men, we're all recovering racists and sexists. Some are just recovering more slowly than others. So it's about not playing that gotcha, um, you're bad. We all have come from a place, Aboriginal jokes used to be said openly at parties. We're all very squeamish when that's mentioned, but it was it was it was the culture here. So I think um, the life and times was more important. And if I'd relied on getting out of Olsen, words out of Olsen, it would have been a twenty-page book. It's only when I brought other people in and he's had other people talking, he's felt the permission that he could talk himself about these things. And I didn't want to. I also pointed out. I also got Frank Stanton's story as well. I interviewed uh, Frank for an extended. I've got Frank's story in there. And a lot of people will sympathize with Frank because they don't feel that if you ask the whole team to wear a polo and someone turns up in their garbage wear 10 minutes before a game's going to be starting, a lot of coaches would see that as a huge destabilizing influence. And Frank just didn't have the lived experience. Back then, the coaches were tyrants in, the, in a good way and in a bad way. You couldn't speak to a player unless you went through the coach. Unless you did full compliance with the coach, you got dropped. There was no real players union to speak of. So it was my way or the highway. So if I don't do the life and times, oh, it's a terrible story and you'd feel miserable and you wouldn't want to read it. It'd be like a book about concussion where a guy, his brain becomes, through CTE, becomes a vegetable. It's just so sad. You'll. But I wanted to um, to tell the hero's journey. Mm. There's Joseph Campbell. I, re I read the book, the, the Hero of a Thousand Faces, before I wrote this book because I was fascinated that a guy called Joseph Campbell in the 40s came out with a book where he studied 250 great legends and myths of ancient cultures and found an unerring pattern similarity. It's not a story unless you've got a reluctant hero that goes off on a quest, crosses the threshold, goes through the road of trials, gets help from wizards and mysterious mentors like Sir Peter Leach and Wayne Wiggum and Graham Lowe. And there's all these guys that have passed Olsen along the line for him to get to greatness. And it's a story with a lot of sporting. And if there's one break in that chain, the guy goes and becomes a normal person. But then the hero fortified by all these mentors has to slay the dragon. And if he hadn't have faced up Wally Lewis in 1985 and showed us everything he'd learnt, that what could be brought out in the right environment of a loving coach and a culturally competent environment and teammates that support him and know who he is and allow for his for his personality and actually recognize that being quiet is a good thing, not a bad thing, not a weak thing. New Zealand's have a slightly different perspective on that. You look at their cricketers, they like 
quiet, achieving guys who lead with their deeds and are very humble. It's a bit different here. Here, you've got to make a lot of noise to get the attention, but in, in some ways, it's the reverse in New Zealand. And you put all those factors together, and without that 85 series, we really do have a hot and cold, rocks and diamonds, is the modern parlance for it. Latrell's copying it. Latrell Mitchell's copying it right now. It's kind of a, a term for, you know, Latrell's Mitchell's rocks are a lot of people's diamonds. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what I thought about Olsen, the bad days, because you're just expecting wizardry all the time. He just can't have a good day where he gets average meters. That's that's considered to be a, a bad day out. But Graham Lowe just provides what they call in research terms a control group, the placebo on, you know, how do you go with the medicine and how do you go without the medicine. And the, the New South Wales uh, media and Queensland media were onto it because they would call Graham Lowe a conjurer a magician, an alchemist, a sorcerer, mm -hmm. a man that was able to do things with the same base metals that other people weren't able to do. So back then they knew something was going on. They just didn't know what it was. They didn't know that you'd call a Polynesian's mother and talk about a positional change. And then he comes back and says, your mum says, yes, you can beat Wally and she'll give you a clip over the year if you don't. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's an Australian coach would never do that. So Certainly Kiwis have learned a lot from Australians, but I think it's undervalued how much of Australians have learned from Kiwis. Mm. In, in the rugby league band of brothers, um, we just, as Graham Lowe says in the, in the book, Australia think they invented everything, including the air that goes into the ball. But, yeah. you know, we've our fingerprints are over the game as well. well it's, it's along the same lines of, of Graham Lowe being some kind of wizard. When, when you talk about Olsen becoming a different player in, in the Kiwi jersey, you know, he, he grows an extra leg in, in that black jersey. It's like there needs to be something mystical to it there's no examination of well he had a supportive coach he was around uh sympathetic teammates and a shared culture there's no real investigation as to the why or the how it was science and we didn't really have science they'd go and on study tours coaches would go on study tours to study in america but it wasn't really a focus at the time we didn't have science applied to sport it was old school you did laps um, they ran props the same as they ran wingers. So props, all the props knees are all popping now. They're all getting surgery because they were running 10 kilometers. Had nothing to do with the way they played the game. The Kiwis, because Graham Lowe, Graham Lowe is the sum of his environment. So he grew up in um, Odahu, which was a working class suburb, now all gentrified, but the Odahu Leopards live on in, in, in Division 2 of the, of the Fox Memorial Cup in New Zealand. And it was a brewery team. So he grew up amongst the first wave of Polynesians and he started with eighth grade Odahu in a hard scrabble, just died to the bone rugby league place called Murphy Park. I actually went there to New Zealand just to get the feel of it. It's tough. There's nowhere to hide on, on Murphy Park. And he came in eighth grade, worked all the way through, was the first guy to introduce three trainings a night in New Zealand, even something as simple as that. Guys, if we want to win, we've got to train one more night than the rest of them. And then he got his developed his man management and he turned to Odahu into an unstoppable force. And they beat Olsen. The first time Olsen's team, Ungri East, ever made it to the final of the Fox Memorial Cup. And it was Graham Lowe waiting for him. And he had one strategy. Put four men on Olsen and you stop these guys. And they, they, they would neutralize Olsen. If your team's good enough, that creates huge opportunities outside because you're attracting all the players. And in rugby league is a game of gaps. But uh, Mungri East weren't good enough to overcome um, the, Graham Lowe, the Graham Lowe team. So... It's, um, he then won at Brisbane North, the greatest upset in Australian uh, rugby league history, turned an absolute team of misfits. And when they heard a Kiwi unknown was coming to Brisbane North, 26 players left the club. So we had to just stand Napa Dylan's Napa dad, Napa's dad, a Cook Island Maori, who was at same school as Olsen, Odahu, Odahu College, came in and played unbelievably well in Brisbane North. He played a couple of games for North down in Sydney, but then his knees went. But Dylan's, Dylan Napa's talent comes straight down the line from his father. He brought Mark Graham across before Mark Graham went to North. He led Brisbane North to a title up there in Brisbane. And make no mistake, that BRL competition was as hard mm. as Sydney. And the players would consistent that they were a little bit short on fitness, but on creativity and toughness, um, it was the equals. Only because Sydney had the pokies yep. and was able to become the, the epicenter of, of rugby league. New Zealand didn't have pokies and Queensland didn't have pokies and a little anomaly like that can can really establish that the, the NRL when it came down was all about Sydney clubs. Mm. Uh, you, we, we've gone into that in, at, at length in our show, so I, w I won't do it now. This is probably a question I, I should have asked at the start, but when did Olsen become involved in the process? He became involved in the process when I fished it by UQP and he for six, 
I've only really got Olsen's trust about six months ago when I think when he saw the book because he couldn't understand why 35, 40 years later, a book was generally written within 10 years. So he couldn't understand why. He's incredibly camera shy. He's never gotten over the way the media treated him and labeled him. No matter what he did, he, he couldn't shake the label and it impacted all sorts of things that coaches would use. Look what the media have said about you. He was just very, very, very untrustworthy, uh, uh, lacking trust in the media. But probably 2018, he came on board. This is happening. Uh, he read a first draft. He sheepishly admitted to me he'd finally read the whole Guardian article. <laughs> <laughs> and he's read the whole book this time. And it's so beautiful to hear his his interviews now. He was interviewed by Andrew Moore on ABC Grandstand and he's comfortable and happy with his story being told. Um, there are different views of history always and he's happy that his his version is out there now. My version's out there now to um, shoot down some of the narrative. Some people will still think they saw what they saw with their own eyes and that's great. But there are a lot of people who uh, are enjoying this because it marries up with what they saw of Olsen. And they were always confused on why the guy was in, in reserve grade. And I've provided some evidence base for that. And I don't want Frank Stanton to be um, to be vilified. He was a man of his times. He was perhaps the most extreme example of that egalitarian, one-size-fits-all coach. And that's simply the way things were done back then. You could insert any coach in there. But this is Olsen's side of the story, and he wasn't treated well by Frank. And there's no way Frank could have known how to handle Aboriginals or just coaching Larry Corral on the 1982 Kangaroos Tour doesn't give you that week in, week out over the years expertise that, that, that you get. In Olsen's first year, he was coached by Dennis Tuddy. And Dennis Tuddy, another thing I learned, used to go over to New Zealand every off-season to gain weight and work in one of these meat works. <laughs> Him and Arthur Beetson used to go over to New Zealand and they would hang with the Maoris. So when Olsen landed... By fluke, he landed with a coach that understood the Māori people. So he actually had a soft landing. Mm. But it was when Frank came in in the 91, 1981 year, that's when um, it started to unravel for Olsen. Terrible homesickness. Spent $800 one month on phone bills home. Would be just forever on the phone mm. back to his family. And it's interesting that uh, Tana Umaga, the most capped New Zealand captain, the... Um, one of the most capped New Zealand captains, the first Polynesian captain of the All Blacks, was a full-on rugby league player, was drafted by the Newcastle Knights. Um, after three weeks, got so homesick, went home and, and played rugby union. So he's one of the great losses. Oh, uh, you mentioned that in the, the Tom Brock address uh, you, you gave late last year, and I was there in the audience going, oh, could have used that play. <laughs> Joan yeah. Lomo, the same. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Joan Lomo, again, poached by the New Zealand uh, rugby league system, but a rugby league fanatic. And Joan Lomo mo modelled, I spoke to John Lomo, his brother, his number one hero growing up was Olsen mm. Filipina. And when Olsen, when Joan Delomu had his This Is Your Life, he invited Olsen, flew Olsen into Auckland for This Is Your Life. And there's an amazing story that just says to, a lot about Olsen for me. It was when Joan Delomu's rugby union schoolboy team under 14s was over in Sydney and someone had mucked up their accommodation. And they called Olsen in desperation and the whole half, half the team came and stayed at Olsen's house. <laughs> And Olsen says, you know, as a Polynesian, you can't even think about saying no to mm. that. He said, my, my only memory is they took forever to get out of the bathroom, which most 14-year-olds do. And they did a haka in his backyard in, in, in Ride, which set the neighbors <laughs> <laughs> worrying what was going on. These <laughs> shrieks and howls and claps and stomps of the, of, of the haka in suburban Sydney one, uh, one midweek night. So that was a, an interesting insight into just that, that Polynesian generosity and hospitality in full flight. Do you think Olsen's found peace or has this book helped in that process? I think it has. I think when you're, when you feel that you're in any sphere of life, if you feel like your side of the story hasn't been aired for, for, for better or worse, you just want to be heard. I think that's a fundamental human need on, on, on anything. And that's why we have the court system and we'll even subsidize lawyers for people that can't afford them. So at least their side of the story can be heard. And Olsen speaks for a lot of Polynesians who, felt they were somehow letting the side down by criticizing the system that had that had given them um, financial windfall and, and given them you know a status in society. But now with the Polynesians where they are, I think he's happy. I think he's happy to tell his side of the story. And just, I think a lot of people in New Zealand have called it a catharsis. Mm. I've spoken to Olsen that he, he seems happy. He jokes about it now. He really embraces media when it comes down down the pipe. And he said to me a few times, I mean, he, he's not 
that happy to bring up his father who, who beat him very badly when he was young. He lost his best friend, Johnny uh, Tucson, in 1978, where he played unbelievably well. He dedicated that year to his best friend that died in an industrial accident. So he's had some moments in bringing those up. I think if anyone has their biography and they bring up the, the sad bits of, of their life. And one regret he had he has is that no one that ever racially abused him has come up and ever said sorry. So he's got that. I mean, sorry still remains the most powerful word we have. And you can forgive almost anything if someone genuinely apologizes. But he's never named anyone in the book that racially abused him. Um, he's got the rugby league code of honor. And I respect that. I tried. I asked if he'd like to name anyone. This is this is part of it. But we all we both agreed in the end we didn't want that to be the key piece of the marketing in the book. And what the book is remembered for that one controversial piece can overshadow a lot of the themes that I just wanted to set out far far and wide. You know, the depression um, side of society. You know, has a new a new hero in their group. He's never really come out or been associated with depression, but he's, he's happy to talk about it then. But back then there was a stigma, mm. as he says in there, you know, if you were branded a loony back in the day, people didn't want to talk to you. Now people at all levels, look, Ben Iken just copped it because he made some you know, old fashioned comments about mental health where a lot of people treat mental health like any disease. If you had kidney stones um, or diabetes, people wouldn't say, don't play rugby league if you could. And people now say that with mental health, it's just, a, it's another disease, but it had a huge stigma and, you know, one flew over the cuckoo's nest and things we were fed that was like, you've left society. Uh, you're not a functioning member of society if you're diagnosed with mental mental health. It's, you know, it's thrilling now that people come out and talk about it. So I think he's, to look back and be able to talk about that is I think is a very a very good thing for his his own mental health. Um, and he has a son uh, in, in Long Bay who he visits every uh, two or three weeks. You know, great love in the Polynesian community. It's not a stigma because of the over-representation of um of polynesians in 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 jail and some of them are doing it just to send money home to their families as well there's some societal pressure there um i think olsen's going to go retire and go back to new zealand he's done his 40 years mm -hmm. in oz when 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 his son his son i spoke to his son his son is a handsome smart intelligent guy who just you know succumbed to the lure of quick cash so Olsen wants to tidy up all his loose ends family and I think he's going to retire and go back to New Zealand where he's loved. Mm. Like he's loved here. A lot of Australian fans love him as well and I think more love him than, than don't. But those that didn't um, really skewered him and um, it's hard to um, for him to reconcile that. And he also could never understand why New South Wales people could hate Wally Lewis yeah. <laughs> so much. He just didn't understand why they could be congratulating him for beating Wally. Uh, you know, he really shocked at the, that the north-south divide. I'll, I'll save that for everyone to read in the book because the, the Wally stuff is is great. So we won't get into that here. Uh, I hope this discussion's made clear to anyone listening that this is a, a very different kind of rugby league book. And so just to finish up, I wanted to, to touch on, I noticed in your acknowledgements, you mentioned Joe Gorman as being somewhat of a mentor and, and his writing being an influence. Uh, his great book, Heartland, is the same thing. It's, it's a very different way of telling rugby league stories. I'd, I'd put Steve Mascord's recent memoir in, in the same category. What, what, what's the climate now based on your experience? I know you mentioned troubles getting the book going, but based on the reaction to the book and all that, what, what do you think about the future of telling these types of stories? I think there is a new breed of writer out there. And I'd look at the podcasters now, um, aren't far from, books with the appropriate stimulus and environment. Rugby league is perhaps the luckiest sport in Australia for the amount of literature. And that says to me that the game has more meaning. And I argued this recently and people, it offends people, but I think AFL and rugby league sit differently to the other sports. And I make the case that it is, is an essential service. It's earned the right to be on Maslow's lowest rung. It means so much to people's mental health. Some people will pay for their memberships before they pay their rent. Mm. These are rusted on and people's moods uh, are, are buoyed from being part of the tribe, win or loss. It doesn't matter. You're, you're part of something. And rugby league is Sydney's story and it's Brisbane's story. No matter what any other sports do, rugby league is the only one that claimed you at a, at a local area level. That uh, Tom Brock con rugby league conference we went to, I don't think other sports exist at that level where because of its authenticity and because it's so working class, and I repeat that Tony Collins quote, the only sport founded on a principle, it has so much meaning for 
um, the people around it that some people cross the line and write a book. You don't write a book now to make money. That's the new paradigm. You you make you you do it to be a storyteller. And that's why I think the podcast people are effectively verbal books. If you put together your sixteen episodes of Super League, oh, uh, we're up to twenty three chapters now. Tw- twenty three chapters. That is a, an audible book, effectively ed- edited. So, um, and people are struggling with the concept of a book. I have had to retrain myself to read books. I read a book a week now and force myself into it. And I do 100 pages a session so I don't wander and I switch everything off. And I've had to retrain my brain away from Rogan podcasts, mm-hmm. so many things um, going on. And I find my retention increases through books. I think the big gap in the market is the NRL and rugby league not realizing how important this culture is. Mm-hmm. That where young kids are going to read about Olsen for the first time and feel part of this larger intergenerational thing. The A-League would kill. The A-League hasn't connected back with their multicultural roots. They've uh, Football back then had the same meaning, I think, that Rugby League has now, back in the NSL days. Mm. It, I think the A-League has a long way to go. It's done all of its you know, tough love and de-ethnicized the sport. But that came, at a, that, that came at a cost which they're paying now. I don't hear anyone clamoring for the A-League. I don't hear anyone really clamoring for Super Rugby. I hear shoot shield in Rugby Union. People, you know, that's where approximately the, the passion levels approximate... Uh, rugby league but i've said in a few interviews i think rugby league you, you get the high levels of passion and everything because their players burn the boats they don't have a plan b they want to be a rugby league player at all costs and it just gives gets these and they pr- most 99 percent appreciate being there and love being there and it's everything they wanted to, they never wanted to be a stockbroker they never wanted like when david pocock went to took a year off to to work with endangered rhinos that wouldn't happen in rugby league because you know some guy will take your spot and you'll never get back in. And you can't imagine doing anything else in the world. If you're fit enough to play rugby league, you can never imagine doing anything else in the world. And pretty much all of us that grew up in New South Wales were rugby league players until someone told us we weren't. <laughs> we all wanted to gravitate and play for Wests or Canterbury or whatever. It was just the, the thing that grabbed our hearts. And there's just an honesty about it that makes it almost impermeable to any scandal. Mm. We all, and, and the, the one thing I mentioned is, you know, Rugby league players get called, or fans get called mungos and primitive, but it has more culture than the other sports, sporting culture. In England, this sporting life, the mm. book, you know, I can't write the book I wrote about rugby league about some other sport because it doesn't have that level of authenticity and meaning. So quite ironically, the group they say has no culture, has historian societies pouring over archives and writing books. So... I think it's rugby league's advantage that we have these books. I think the NRL should have a cultural fund that seeds any author $10,000 to commit to a topic that they want to explore because you're not going to get your money back from your advance from a publisher, which might only be three or four or five or six K. It takes about 20 or 30,000 to write a book. You'll put in 10 of your own because you might get that back. But to wear all that yourself is highly discouraging. And then we all have to rebuild that community where everyone buys each other's books and creates a market that Mm. makes it viable. But I think it's the NRL because... Why not ram that home? Like the, the history department's, you know, locked up now. Mm. I don't know if you've been up there, but it is magnificent. Oh, yeah. Out the back there and you can go through all the old. They've got everything to support. They've got volunteers who go out the back. And and so we've got all this infrastructure to, to highlight culture. And it goes back to one of your original uh, points. There's no need for fiction in rugby league <laughs> when the nonfiction stories are just so wild. And mm. all we do need to do is tell them and wrap them in context and we have a market that loves it. And that's where um, Joe pitched his book, which I still think has a long way to go. Um, and I hope that resurfaces big time uh, during the 40th mm. uh, origin, um, the 40th origin celebrations. And you know, I'd like Joe to go on a book tour through Queensland because there is a huge intelligent middle-class rump in rugby league that buys books that is accountants, partly due to the Catholic school system and partly due to the fact that league was able to crush union in australia and the middle class in new zealand are, a lot of them are sneaky warriors fans they don't like to admit it but mostly the middle class are with um are with rugby union and it's really drawn on class lines here but you wouldn't get the broadcast audience and the, and the dollars if it was just a working class game in australia it's definitely uh, a lot of ceos like rugby league and and view it as authentic and a true uh, man's game not to not that not to put that in a bad light in a good light it brings out a lot of the best things um about men backing up each other and training hard and being the best you can be and supporting the weak and 
so many good things come out of out of rugby league. Yeah, there's there's negative things, but I don't want to live in a world without rugby league and boxing scooping up these alpha males and instructing them. Because in the old days, they got they went off to war, as Sam Burgess and guys like that um, often say. And I like the fact that they have a place where they can channel their energy and learn about bullying. And hey, you're not the biggest guy, and now you get a bit of empathy and uh, shake hands afterward. And in some cases, be mates for life. It's it's at its best, it's a beautiful thing. At its worst, it's not a good thing as well, but I think the positives far outweigh the negatives. Oh, stirring words, mate. Had had chills with that. So w- what a great place to finish. Uh, congratulations. This is a wonderful achievement. You, you've done such a great job. Uh, encourage all Rugby League Digest listeners to go out and buy a copy. Uh, on the day that this interview was released will actually be the release date for the book in Australia. Uh, you can also buy it at thebigo.kiwi. Is that the correct yeah, URL? www.thebigo.kiwi. Yeah. Uh, anything else to say about the book? or? Um, I think anyone who wants to find out uh, about the, this revolution of rugby league, the Pacific Revolution, I always think storytellers stand the best chance of educating people. It's here to stay, and I think it's something that should be celebrated and we should all learn about it. It's meant that international rugby league is now a force. We could have six teams in 10 years that, that are all a chance of winning the World Cup, which is fantastic. That's a huge, huge plus for the game. That's the same as rugby union. They've only got six countries that are real contenders as well. So um, there's a lot of good that's come out of it. And it's also good to know where we came from um, as, as a country and to uh, look at those who had to go through a lot more to play the game that we all love and to respect and honor uh, those pioneers. Mm. From Daly Messenger at the very start, who save rugby league to the Maldi team that came in 19 they save rugby league and and guys like olsen uh, open open up rugby league to new markets and i'm absolutely honored to be able to share his story mm, beautiful uh thanks so much for joining us patrick my pleasure